I'd like to do is um, come back to, to the situation where we, we were talked about selecting cows for fertility and identifying the most fertile cows. And currently there are no uh, selection criteria that can do that. The criteria we're using at the moment are not genetically discerning enough. And that doesn't mean that fertility is not highly irritable. Fertility is highly irritable, it cannot be otherwise, uh, unless survival of the fittest doesn't apply. So the problem is not the, the characteristic of fertility that's lowly irritable, but the measurements we take are lowly irritable, meaning that the variation we see is mainly environmental and not genetic. Because what you see and what you measure is both genetic and environment, in other words, phenotype. So what we have to do is devise selection criteria that are genetically discerning. In other words, the variation you see between animals that you can measure or see is basically genetic. And what we talked about is that we can use intercarving period. That is a period between two successive carvings. And in this case, particularly, the first heifer is a calf for the first time and again the second time. So if you take that intercarving period and you plot it on the graph here, and the equivalent days from calving to first cycle, which would equate to that intercarving period if you added 285 days onto that. That's a gestation period. I'll give you this here. Now, what I did here, I gave you intercarving periods of four cows, uh, five cows, A, B, C, D, E, F, six cows. And then I asked you which was the most fertile cow, which had the shortest intercarving period, this cow here has the shortest intercarving period. But she's not the most fertile. Because what we have here in any situation where we carve over a, uh, over a period is that some cows will carve at a time when nutrition is better than other cows. So we have to take it into account. So what I've done here, these figures are from my environment, which might be a little bit different to yours here. If, I, if my cows carved at this period here, uh, June, July, August, they'd have a very long period from carving to first cycle. As opposed to here, they have a very short period from carving to first cycle. So what I've done is I've drawn, drawn a graph. And in my conditions, what it means is that for every day you carve closer to the rains, to mid rainy season, you, gain, you shorten the intercarving period by three quarters of a day. In certain environments, I've done uh, uh, work in that period is 0.9 of a day. For every day you carve closer to the middle of the rainy season, you shorten the intercarving period by 0.9 of a day. That means over a 100 day carving period, the cow that carves in the first day only cycles 10 days earlier than the cow that carves on the last day. That's a very big influence. So one has to take into consideration when you're using intercarving period to work out the fertility, assess the fertility of a cow. So that's what we've done here. I've drawn the graph here, and that relates to three quarters of a day closer to the middle of the rainy season. So when, what we do is we look at the individual intercarving period of a cow. Cow A carved in this date here. She had an individual intercarving period of 425 days. The average there was 395 days. If you divide 395 by 425, you get a figure of 93, factor 93. That is the fertility index. In other words, she's lower, poorer than average. So, and these cows here with different intercarving periods, 395, 365, and 325, have exactly the same in terms of the genetic fertility, because they carved on the line there. So does everyone understand that, the basics of that, the principles involved? And again, I must just emphasize the date here refers to the first carving date. And the, the second carving date determines your intercarving period. So it's the first date that determines the, how long is they're going to take to cycle or how long they're going to take to recarve again. Is that, is that post post That's right, yes, yeah. yeah. It's days from carving to first cycle, heat cycle. That is what determines the fertility of the cow, how many days it takes to cycle after carving. So what you see, if you come to, to the middle of the rainy season here, that graph flattens off at 40 days, which means that the average intercarving period, or average day from carving to first cycle, at that period is 40 days. Over here, it's about 150, 160 days. 
So what does that mean? Should we carve here or should we carve there? Remember the bottom one refers to the southern northern hemisphere. So the best time of carving here would be equivalent to my southern hemisphere. And your northern hemisphere would be June, July, August. Does that make sense? Why it should be like that? Yep. When's the best nutrition? What? When is the best nutrition here? In, in July and when would the cows be best body condition when they carved? In July and exactly. So, is there any argument of when we should carve? So, why do people carve in winter? In I know what the reason is. One of the reasons is. No, but it might be one of the reasons here in, the, in your part of the world. The other reason is that people want heavy weights at weaning. So if you carve at an inappropriate time for the cow, you will get heavy weaning weights, but the ex at the expense of cow fertility. Now what's most important, weaning weight or fertility? You see what happens is if you carve at this time, remember the average cow takes 40 days to cycle. So what does that mean? If you have a short breeding season of 42 days, it means that your poorest cow that takes 60 days to cycle, even if she carved at the end of the breeding season, she will still cycle within the first cycle of the breeding season. Your poorest cow, most infertile cow you have. Your, your, most fert, your fertile cows that carve at the, more or less the beginning or the middle of the breeding season, carving season, they will have two to three cycles before you put the bull in. Now imagine what that does to fertility as well cleans out the uterus. Another very important thing that people don't realize is that the work was done here in the United States on feedlot calves. They followed through the time of the calf being born as opposed to uh, the, the um, disease resistance or lack of disease in the feedlot. Calves that were born with the mother's, with the mother's calf in green grass had much higher quality colostrum. Those cows that are born to those cows, calves that are born to those cows that carved on green grass had five times less chance of getting a disease in the feedlot than the ones that carved out of that season. That's a massive difference. Five times less chance of getting a disease. It's just that we have to get into a natural cycle again. And if you do that, it's similarly with grazing. If we imitate a natural system, as we do with the you know, grass, severe graze, or predator, if we carve at the right time, then everything else will be positive. The only difference is that your weaning weights at weaning will be lower. You can imagine that. If a cow carves before the green grass, she produces milk at her own body condition or with uh, extra inputs, so the calf will have a longer period on good nutrition plus green grass. So that calf will be heavier. And that's the main reason why people calf out of sync with this environment here. But the other thing that they don't realize is that your, your yearling weights will be the same because it's a cyclical effect. But more important than that, your 15-month weights on your heifers will be much higher if you carved here in June, July. Just think about it. A uh, heifer being uh, born in June, July will be year old in June, July. She will then have caught up to they will equal uh, yearling weights. But then she's got another two and a half months to grow until the 20th of August before you breed her. So she puts on extra weight. So her 15 month weights could be much higher than if she, if she was born at any other period, time of the year. Okay, so what are the advantages? You have to understand the advantages of having a very short breeding season. I don't know. In the northern climates, further north, most people have a 42-day or 63-day breeding season. But that's unheard of in Africa. And since 1986, I had only a 42-day breeding season because I changed my carving season to here. And remember, we have very poor nutrition, even poorer than what you have here. We have a very short window period where we can carve. And I had the situation where 80 to 90 percent of my cows were cycling before the breeding season started. Now, if you have that situation where 90 percent of your cows, and in this environment, probably at least 90 percent, will be cycling before the breeding season starts, can you see the advantage in terms of AI? How simple it is, how easy it is to AI, to simulate your cows? 
So what I did is I, I simulated, I synchronized my cars, I simulated the first five days, and then day six I, I synchronized all the cars, and they came on heat within the next six days. So by day 11, my breeding season, I'd inseminated 90, at least 90% of my cows. I say you want the cows to be, cows to be born the 1st of June or 15th of June, whenever. When would you start your breeding season? Uh, the 1st of June, I'd say more or less about the 20th of August. 20 August. If you have a, yeah, and more or less. Some will calve a little bit earlier because they have a shortened gestation. And some, but the majority will start calving about the beginning of June. That is one advantage, is effective AI. If you have a short breeding season like that. Extremely effective AI. In fact, if you were worried about it, you could inseminate your cows 11 days prior to your breeding season starting. And still have another 42 days to put the bullet. Well, it's an option. If you can identify your best bulls and you see the reason for doing it, it's a, it's a very good option. If you're serious about improving your cattle, you will do it. Cows calve in very good condition, and I've seen it myself. They can lose condition, they will still cycle. It's much easier to do that. Northern climates, Canada, Northern United States, the photo period has a positive effect, which you probably have a little bit of it here. In the tropics where I come from, we don't have it in terms of fertility. So what I've seen there, cows can calve in poorer condition. They pick up on the high nutrition, they pick up condition very quickly, and they will still rebreed. But in a more subtropical environment like you have here, the condition at calving is far more important than condition at breeding. Condition at breeding will still be good, but condition at calving is more important than anything else. But understand that your weaning weights will be lower, but calving uh, fertility is by far the most important trait that cattle require. And in fact, I have a friend in South Africa who also calves right out of season he calves at that time that I suggest and he keeps his winners back until they just about yearlings and then he sells them. Right. And in South Africa there's a big variation in, in, in uh, weight or uh, price per calf um, because the feedlots buy calves when the, uh, most people calve there's a lot of calves on, uh, available for sale so the price goes down and at the off season the price goes up again so but as I said my friend calf, Calves at a different time and the sells at a different time. And then he puts on another about 100 kilograms on his calves before he sells them. And he sells them at a higher price per kilogram per pound. So that's something you might be able to look at if you have the variations in price, I'm not sure. But even without that, I think it's still advisable in terms of your overall uh, uh, profitability per hectare is to carve at that time. It's just, there's no argument about it. One advantage, as I said, is that your, obviously your cows have a very good reconception rate. Secondly, the option for AI, extremely effective AI. Secondly, thirdly, is that with supplementation, just think how much more effective your supplementation is if your cows calve in a six-week period here, as opposed to here, or even earlier. Because th these cows that are calving here, as opposed to that cow calving there, this cow requires far better nutrition in terms of uh, supplementation. That one doesn't require it. So some cows you're overfeeding, other cows you're underfeeding. But if they're all calving at that time, then the effectiveness of your supplementation is going to be much, much higher. And your stock rate can be higher? It would probably, because you're calving at that time, yes. Your inputs are going to be so much lower. The Move to the calves. Will be much higher. You're getting in sync with natural nutrition, yes. That's what it is. It's just common sense. That's how it should be done. But uh, a question might arise in terms of the adaptation there. So you require better adapted cattle. I think your cattle that are under heat stress would probably have a difficulty rebreeding in August. So. Nutritionally and, and climatic, yeah, both. Nutritional adaptation is very important and climatic adaptation as well. But there's no excuse for us to breed adapted cattle. We have to do it. So it might not happen overnight, but it's, a, it's something to think about. You'd have to figure it might, might take you a year or two or three years to be able to do that.
But changing the bulls to adapted breed, you can do overnight. But the cows might still, that are unadapted, might still have difficulty in terms of the heat or nutrition. And the other factor here is too that you know this pasture may not be good if he's not managing it right in August. These are hot weather grasses, but if they're not mowed or clipped, mm. there's not much left by August, and your cows can lose body condition real bad. So it may be a pasture management issue. That would definitely come into it. You have to manage it for that. You have to manage for body condition as well. And in my environment, what, how I did that was by shortening the recovery period and coming back to nutrition and grazing. So one might do that. It would be an option. You would have to do it. But the, you have to be very careful that you don't do it on the same piece of land every single year. So you might alternate and stockpile different areas, like if you have to stockpile. So it's all these factors that eventually come together. And remember, in nature, one plus one is not two. It's a totally different factor. So if you get all these factors together, the, the positive results are going to be much greater than 1 plus 1 or 1 plus 2. Because you have interactions. Adapted cattle, uh, production in sync with uh, natural occurring nutrition, uh, supplementation to increase effectiveness of the room and to digest grasses, grazing management to increase stocking rate, and uh, increase the nutrition of the cattle at that particular time. You decide which are your most fertile heifers, and then that's where you choose your bulls from. Yes. And he took the top 10% and branded them number one, the second 10% and branded them number two. You know, the other way around. What I did this, if you identify those cows, your top 10% are brand 10. It's easy to understand. If you brand one, it doesn't look. The ranking is number one, two, and three years, but. I would brand a 10 for, number, for the first ranking, then a 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But we're going to come to that. We haven't, uh, we're going to discuss that later. Now, if you have a lot of cows, the problem is here that the majority of your cows will be cycling before you put the bull in. So your intercalving period won't reflect fertility. You follow? Because they aren't bred the first cycle. That's right, they're not bred the first cycle. So what you would have to do here, there's two options. And remember we're talking about first and second calving heifers. That's, that's where I would suggest you do it. You have two options. Either you do heat spotting, which is very difficult. In other words, when a cow calves, you have, you have someone heat spotting all the time. And identify the period from heat, from heat to first cycle. And you could use that in lieu of intercalving period. Or the more practical one is you'd have to change your, extend your breeding season. When the first cow heifer calves, Within a few days, you put a bull in. So you'll have an extended calving period for that first cycle, after, between the first and second breedings. The second year, they go back to the normal season again. So what you will have the next year is your cows that calved earlier, or rather cycled earlier, would calve around about here. But you can get them back into the season again. That's the only other way you can do it. Does you want to follow that? You understand why you can't use intercalving period because you have cows that are cycling a long way before the breeding season starts. So intercalving period wouldn't reflect it unless you put the bull in again. They will be calving this time because that's what you planned them to calve. So your first heifer will be calving more or less the 1st of June. But your most fertile heifer will be cycling 20 days after that. So if you don't have a bull to pick that up, you won't be able to use intercalving period. So you'd have to put the bull in within the first few days after after they start cycling, after, after they start calving, to identify that. Remember, it's very important to do this to identify your most fertile cows. Now you build up a record of all your cows in the herd that will have that number 10 or number 9 or number 7 or number 8 brand on them. Or just your data that you have on computer or paper. Now you can identify your most fertile cows. Does anyone see that, how effective that would be to do that? So, so they will be scored on the, after the, between the first and second, second yes. once in their lifetime. Once in their lifetime. And they are scored. That's, and that's, they that's their fertility forever. <coughs> that's the most difficult period. It's the most difficult period, too, yes. So let's talk a little bit, a bit about selection. Uh, 
And what do we say is the most important trait? Fertility. Corrected ICP. So you can identify your cows and you can rank them in terms of their fertility. Let's go back again here. We have these 100 cows. And now we can rank them in terms of their fertility. So the top 10%, you could brand uh, number 10 on them. Second, number 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, down to 1. So even if your cows, you had a 100% calving record, you could still identify them in terms of the genetic fertility, as we just described now. Does everyone understand? And see how effective that would be. So there are different times where the cow body condition will be affected. If it's March, April, then that's when you should carve. But I question whether March, April over a long period of time is going to be the best. It might be in certain years. So we have to look at the average period that will be best for calving. Okay. So what it means is that there is an optimum period in terms of cow body condition and reconception rate and shorter inter um, period between calving and first cycle because that is what limits the fertility. Is the analysis period between calving and the first cycle. That determines everything. Okay. So there's optimum period. Now in my environment, I'm just giving an example here, for every day that I carve closer to the rains, mid rains, that will be your equivalent of your June, July. For every day I carve closer to that, the intercarving period decreases by three quarters of a day. So for every day, so for, for every 10 days I carve later, I score three and a quarter days, three and a half days in intercarving, short intercarving period. Uh, seven and a half days. Okay, let's take an extreme, extreme case, which I have seen, where the period, the, the, the decrease in intercarving period or increase in fertility is 0.9 of a day for every day you carve later, towards the middle of the rainy season, to, towards June, July, yeah. 0.9 of a day. That means if you have a 100 day carving season, average cow, what's, what's the name? Daisy. If Daisy calves on day one, and Daisy calves on day 100, same cow, there will only be 10 days difference when they have the first cycle. In other words, Daisy one will only cycle 10 days prior before Daisy two. Actual date. That's how big that influence is. It's the same as feeding this cow, which you, this cow here more than feeding that cow here. Because that's exactly what you're doing. This, this graph here represents that. That's the average. So you see these cows here, B, D, and F. They have very different intercarving periods. They have different periods when they uh, cycle after carving but they, they have the same fertility because you're relating them to the average. Why does the PPA pain vary so much? This, this is the same. All you have to do is add 285 days to get that figure there because that's the gestation period. So this is days from carving to first cycle of first conception and that would be the equivalent in the carving period. It's very, very simple. It's just you have to get your thinking around to understand that this date here at the bottom refers to the first carving date. So that determines how long it's going to take to cycle and how long the intercarving period is going to be. So now, talking about fertility, we want to select for fertility, so we want uh, criteria that are genetically discerning. So cow, for the cow, it will be corrected intercarving period. Does everyone understand that? Corrected intercarving period, not the normal intercarving period. It has to be corrected for environmental differences. Now, so what you will do in terms of bull selection, you will select your bulls, obviously, out of your most fertile cows. But you also have to select bulls for other criteria. For temperament, for body uh, conformation, muscling, um, for milk from the mother's side, uh, for easy care attributes. So you, you, you would probably not restrict yourself to the top 10% of cows. You might say the top 20 or 30% of cows in terms of fertility. But that's better than selecting a bull at the bottom from the poorest cow which you could do if you didn't have these dot, this data. Okay. So you select your bulls out of that group of bulls, and then you select them for other criteria as well. Muscling, 
uh, temperament, etc., etc. But there's one proviso in terms of bull selection that's extremely important. That you don't have to do the cow. Because the cow you're going to breed, or heifers, is 15 months. So the most fertile will be identified, as we've just said now. But the bull, there's two, two determinants of practical fertility. I talk about practical and academic fertility. There are two determinants, basic determinants of practical fertility. One is hormonal balance. I'll describe that later, discuss that later. The other one is body condition, inherent body condition. Does anyone have any doubt about the fact that, practically speaking, um, the most uh, important factor determining cow fertility is body condition? Do you agree or disagree? Agree. Body condition is by far the most important. If you don't breed it, you have to feed it. Okay. So we have to make sure that a bull. Although he comes from those cows, the chances are that he will have good inherent body condition. The chances are good. But let's be 100% sure. So what we do is, in, the, in terms of bull, we also select him for 12-month maturity. And I talked about that uh, two days ago. I'd just like to discuss that more fully with you. How do we, how do we select... Remember, we are, what we're doing with 12 month maturity is we're selecting for grass conversion efficiency, which will be reflected in body condition and is determined by a high relative intake. And the high rel relative intake is determined by four factors. Frame size, optimum frame size for the environment, climatic adaptation, parasite disease resistance, and individual appetite. So all those things will be reflected in 12 month maturity. So that one measurement reflects all that. That's all we require. Frame size, adaptability, what was the third? Parasite disease resistance and individual appetite. Some cattle just have an ability to eat more than others. And do we have a rule of thumb for optimum frame size? As small as possible. <laughs> no, not quite that. Uh, very good environments, uh, good nutritional environments will allow a larger frame. They can still be productive. But very poor nutrition, like here, you will need a much smaller frame size. So it's difficult for me to say what frame size. I just say optimum frame size. But that will be determined by that over time. But as a general rule of thumb, our cattle are too big frame size-wise, generally speaking, because we have selected for size and growth rate that's related to size. So generally speaking, our more uh, early maturing animals will fall in a smaller frame size. But rem well, the low octane grass like here would be 3.5 or something like that. I'm not too sure about frame size. I've heard people talking about it. It'll probably be another. that. Yeah, it'll be, I'm not sure exactly what it'll be. I can tell you how to select for it. But it'll probably be in a smaller frame, three, four, maybe two. But remember, when we're talking about smaller frame size, we're not talking necessarily about lighter cattle. They'll still be heavy. They will be heavy relative to their frame size. Eight and five. Eight and five. That's why they will look like that. And that is what we do in this measurement. What animal will be benefited in terms of his uh, um, overall shape? Which animal will be, have the highest maturity rate, 12 month maturity? Remember, to be equally efficient, an animal has to grow in proportion to its size. So the animal that, in proportion to its size, has grown the fastest will be the most efficient. Now, what will that animal look like? So, uh, eight pounds yes, it'll be round. It'll be that stocky, short type of, of bull that's generally discriminated against. Okay, so what we're doing here, by doing this 12 maturity, and I'll explain how we do it, we're taking size out of the equation. So we're not selecting for smaller size cattle. Your most mature animal could be in a high frame score, but it's very, very unlikely. Why would it be unlikely? Sorry? He can't eat that much. That's exactly. It's all about intake. He has a low relative intake because he's genetically uh, handicapped in terms of frame size and intake. So they won't be in those large frame size. They'll be somewhere intermediate. It might not be the smallest frame size either because the animal might be small for the wrong reasons. You can get cattle that are small for the wrong reasons. So we're selecting for the most efficient. 
but they will be in the smaller frame category. So how do we work out 12 month maturity? We talked about it a few days ago. I'm just going to write some examples down here. So this will be hip height here. And I'm metric, so I'm going to, I've done it in centimeters, but you can always... And this will be bull frame size, but I've, I've put frame size in kilograms, which you can do. If you go to Missouri frame score tables, they will give you those uh, criteria. They will give you the frame and the average frame size for a cow or a bull or whatever. For a cow, I've added on 60% for the bull because the bull is about 60% heavier than a cow is at the frames, same frame size. So that's the figures I've got there. So what you do is, for any particular bull, let's go, go to 12 month. I have here um, 6, 7 and 8 month uh, graphs and then I've got 11, 12 and 13 months. Let's go to the 12 month graph here. And let's say we have a bull of, of a, with a frame uh, hip height at 12 months. So 12 months we measure them, the hip height, and we also measure, the, we weigh them in, to get their weights at 12 months. Okay. So if we go, we have a bull here that's 110 centimeters tall at 12 months. So they go up to 12 months, and then they grow, go across to the left. What will that weight be? It's predicted mature size in terms of kilograms. 675, more or less, is it? Yeah. Okay, so let's say bull A. About 675, 680. So let's do a bit of a thing here. Okay, so let's say bull A was, 100, was 110 centimeters, so it was seven, what's 670? About 690. 690. Let's look at bull A, he's 115 centimeters tall at the hip. What will that predicted mature size give us in terms of kilograms? 115? Just look at 115 corresponding to 12 months. 750? 760, okay, it's 760. Uh, let's go to one, um, 125, the big bull. Like 125 centimeters. 125 uh, centimeters. 870. 870. Yes. Okay, then we have another bull D that's also 690. Nine hundred ten. Well, let's say nine hundred. It will be six ninety as well. So we've got four examples here. He's also one hundred and five centimeters. So six ninety is predicted at your size. The actual weights at twelve months. When you weigh them at twelve months, just an example. Those are the actual weights: two seventy, two fifty, three hundred and two eighty. Okay, which bull would we select normally if we looked at those four bulls as it? 12 months of age. Bull C. Bull C. He's the heaviest. So we would think he's best. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to work out the maturity percentage. In other words, uh, the actual weight of 12 months relative to the mature size. So we have to divide uh, 270 by 690. 270 divided by 690? 39. 39. And 250 divided by 760? 33. And uh, 300 divided by 900? 300 divided by 900? Yeah. 33 as well, isn't it? 33. And 280 divided by 690? 41. Okay, now if you look at those figures, which is the best bull? Which bull is most mature at 12 months? Which bull has got the fullest package? Which bull will have the best body condition? 
which bull would have converted grass most efficiently into beef? D. D. Forty-one percent. So although these two bulls, A and D, have the same frame size, we're still selecting for the heavier animal. He's 270, he's 280. But we're doing it within a frame size. We're not selecting for the heaviest animal regardless of... Uh, uh, we're selecting for the heaviest animal regardless of frame size. We're taking frame size into consideration, sorry. If we select it regardless of frame size, we select that animal here. But he's not the most efficient grass converter. He won't have the best body condition. Just think about it. Which animal will have better body condition? The one that's 33% mature or the one that's 41% mature? It must be. It can't be otherwise. Because what... Exactly. That's why we have to do the bull selection. We have to do that for 12 months maturity. So we have to select bulls from fertile cows and then we have to go through this process as well. Select the bulls that have a high maturity as well. Because then they will, it's no point having a bull like this, it's heaviest. He's going to produce daughters that are, have poor inherent body condition to this bull here. So we want to select the animal that's the most efficient grass converter as reflected in body condition. So that's where that 12 month maturity comes in. And then another, we talked about it yesterday. You now have 10 bulls that you've selected according to the, this criteria from most fertile cow. You've looked at this, you've looked at other criteria as well. Um, body condition, temperament, uh, not body condition, muscling, temperament, easy care. And then you put those bulls um, You take those 10 yearling bulls, you put them to 100 yearling heifers in a multi size situation, and next year when the calves are born, you do a DNA test and you identify the one or two bulls that gave you the most calves. I know no better definition of bull fertility than that, because it takes everything into consideration. The same age bulls, it's not different age bulls that will dominate, the older bull dominating young bull, they're the same age. They're born within 42 days. So the bull that's the most masculine, the most dominant in terms of his testosterone levels, his ability to serve cows, and his uh, semen quality is going to give you the most calves. And what would that mean for breeding season again? Well, I was suggesting, I'm suggesting 42 days, six weeks. Because the cycle is about 20, 21 days. So let's give him two cycles, the 42 days. Well, that's, that's cattle, cattle selection extremely simplified and extremely, extremely effective, if you think about it. Now, if we went through that process, has anyone any doubt that we won't make progress in terms of fertility, genetic fertility? Can't be otherwise. Because what we're doing is we're allowing nature to identify, or the environment to identify the most fertile animals and most cross-efficient converters. We're allowing nature to do that by those simple measurements we take. And all we have to do now is accelerate that process. In other words, that one or two bulls that have extremely high uh, breeding ability, that come from very fertile cows, that have a very good body condition, the, the ideal would be to use the semen from them on as many cows as possible for one year. And you repeat the process every single year. So every year new bulls are coming in. And if you, if you close your herd, you're breeding half-brother and half-sister, you're going to concentrate those genes for vitality, for vigor, for fertility, for climatic adaptation, for body condition. That's what nature has identified as the most efficient animal. That's all, that, that is our... The only role we have as cattle breeders is to identify the most efficient cattle as defined by nature, not by man, and accelerate that process. It's as simple as that. <laughs>